Uh, we want to move on to one of those disruptive forces. Your next rapid fire keynote, keynote is Daniel Eberhard. He's co-founder and CEO of Coho, which is described as offering millennials a no-fee alternative to banking, which sounds ageist to me. <laughs> but we'll get to that later. Um, it's backed by some of the biggest uh, investor names in the world. It won uh, the NASDAQ Prize for Best FinTech. And he is a serial entrepreneur. His previous company was called uh, Kineticor Renewables, which he sold to Algonquin Power. Please join me in welcoming Daniel Eberhard to the stage. Awesome. This is, uh, this is great. I want to thank you guys for, for having me. Uh, so as I was thinking about how to create value for you guys today and, and looking at some of the resumes of the other speakers, uh, it became pretty clear to me that, that I wasn't in a position to create value in the way they were. They can talk about the industry, rattle off 20, 30 years of experience, and, and just and do that offhand, right? And um, we're not really in a position to do that. I've been in payments for two and a half years. Uh, the industry is maybe a year and a half old by any sort of reasonable metric. So uh, the way that I thought I would create value for you guys today is just to share our story and, and use that as sort of a metaphor for what's happening in fintech because uh, I think we are seeing some really exciting things. Uh, so to, to set the groundwork, what we actually do uh, for millennials or not is we offer people a, a no-fee sort of alternative. So direct deposit, bill pay, ATM, a lot of that core functionality is there. And then we do some things that a traditional sort of bank account wouldn't do. So we have real-time updates. We let you categorize your spend, automatic savings goals. Um, and then there's things that checking accounts can do that we can't. So it is sort of a, an alternative. Uh, but we, and, and you heard some of that from, from Amanda, have, have done a really good job of making a lot of noise. And there's this concept, especially in tech, called signal versus noise. And so if you think about this, if we think about going to a concert, uh, the signal is what you're there to hear. It's the music, it's, it's the experience that you're, or the, the key metrics, if you will. Uh, the noise is the audience and the text messages and, and the drinks that gets built on you and all the things that distract you from actually the fundamental metrics of, of the business or the, the concert. And so we're a really good example of that. We've got funding. As Amanda said, we've, got, we've raised a couple rounds of funding. Some of the best investors in, in Canada and Silicon Valley have, have backed us. Uh, that's us as a team of six with our, our logo floating around the, the Times Square in New York. And, and we've got 7,000 people waiting for us to launch. Uh, we went live about a month ago. We're still in sort of a private beta. Uh, all of this is not, none of this is revenue. None of this is profitability. And it's not user growth, right? And so I think that we're seeing a lot of that in fintech, where there's an enormous amount of noise, but we're still trying to find the signal as an industry. And so this is how we work. Uh, we sit on top of the existing regulatory framework. We've partnered with People's Trust, who is here. Uh, and so they take the deposits. And we sit on top of this ecosystem. And so when we talk about you know, fintechs versus banks, we don't really want to disrupt anything. I think that the Canadian banking system and the regulators do an incredible job of moving trillions of dollars a year. And we know how complicated it is. It's really, really hard. And so we want to sit on top of that framework and complement it. And, and I think the really big thing about fintechs that, that's different uh, is that we get to be wrong. And that's a really important part of this. We get the banks have to be they're 99.999% of the time, and they have to offer something to everyone. And, and we don't, and that gives us a lot of freedom as a company to find value for our users. Now, it also gives us the chance that we're going to fail, and, and we're OK with that. Um, you know, FinTechs uh, have this narrative that, that we're not regulated. And, and while that's not true, we are regulated uh, just in a different way. Um, one of the areas that I think we need to focus on with regulators and, and fintech companies is how do we make sure that these fintech companies can fail without hurting consumers? And, and so we're in a position to do that because our partner holds our deposits. Um, but that's something that I think we need to collectively address as an industry. But the other thing is we might be wrong for almost everyone. Maybe one in 10 people likes Coho. Maybe one in 20 or one in 50. Uh, 
given that we are a team of 10 based in Vancouver, that's still a really big win for us, and it's not a loss for the banks. You know, again, this, this fintechs versus banks narrative, uh, us, us getting one in 50 people or creating value for one in 50 people uh, doesn't challenge the Canadian banking framework. I think it complements it. And the, our ability, uh, so within that realm of, of our ability to fail, uh, the other side of that coin, the positive side of that coin, is that we listen very differently. This is the, the product feedback loop, where you build, you measure, and you iterate. Uh, pretty standard in, in technology companies. We measure everything. We have alerts that pop up that say, Did, was that a good purchase to make? Uh, do you like seeing your spendable this way? And we're collecting millions of data points this year, and we'll implement them really, really quickly. We're on pace to update our application 100 times this year, versus sort of a traditional uh, bank application might update two to, to four times in a year. And so we can take that feedback and have it back in the application in a matter of weeks. So I think that's really, really compelling when it comes to understanding what it is that consumers want, finding that value, and bringing it to market. And so I want to talk about uh, where we're actually going. And, and I think that there's a, the, the short-term direction of us as a company and FinTech overall is to find really meaningful ways to create value. And so when I look at the millennial market, uh, there, there's some big challenges that we face. The average savings rate for a millennial is, ne is neutral or, or minus 1%. Uh, within that realm, we're all kind of saving for some vacuous notion of retirement, not actually knowing how we're doing on that path. And that creates a lot of really challenging psychology for, for us when it comes to our money. And we're seeing this sort of fragmentation of, of lifestyles with millennials, right? Where we're collectively grouped as millennials, but the reality is, uh, I think that misses the mark. You know, 18 to 34 year olds is an incredibly broad spectrum to lump people into. I think that what the internet has done is it has allowed us to sort of find our, our tribe in more meaningful ways, meaning that I have much more in common with a 45 year old who works on Bay Street or a 16 year old who codes than I do with a 29-year-old who lives in Fort McMurray or is a fisherman or, or whatever that happens to be, our lifestyles are fundamentally different. And yet we still are sort of collectively lumped in as millennials, which I think, which I think misses the mark. You know, we're seeing this, this on, the, on the one side here, we have sort of the traditionalist lifestyle where you're getting a mortgage and, and the white picket fence, and, and that's, that's great. Um, but we're also seeing this new emergence of lifestyles, which is digital nomads, where you're going to make six or $70,000 a year working from your laptop, and you're going to live in Bali or Argentina and spend $15,000 a year in living expenses. And that's actually becoming a really practical thing to do because there's an enormous savings arbitrage opportunity in that process. Those people are now saving more than, than sort of the picket fence. And then on the other side, you have, you have abstainers who just want to surf in the, in the summer and ski in the winter, and, and that's cool too. I did a couple of years of that. Uh, and the other, the other element of this, right, is that expectations are becoming increasingly high from a technical perspective. Amanda talked about Airbnb. Uh, what do you guys think the average rating is that you have to have as a host with Airbnb or as a driver with Uber? Maybe three, three and a half. It's 4.2, or excuse me, 4.6. So as soon as your rating as a driver or an Airbnb host drops below 92%, uh, you're not gonna get rides anymore, and you're not gonna be able to host people. So with this, 92 times out of 100, we're having experiences which are five stars, and that's becoming the norm. So when, when you consider these factors, the, the fragmentation of the lifestyle, the increasing expectation, the the financial sort of confusion that, that a lot of millennials live in, I think there's an enormous opportunity to create some value. Now you guys are going to see my geek gear side. I was in uh, New York last week at, at Exponential Finance, and I was in Vienna a couple weeks before that, uh, really seeing what's going on on sort of the cutting edge of finance. And, and you've, you've sort of heard some allusions to this, but I'm really interested in the question of if we can optimize our financial lives. Can we offer people an anti-budget, where we say, 
you should go take that trip, buy that snowboard, whatever that happens to be, because it'll make you happier and you're doing really well on your way to retirement. Right? Really, really complicated question. But I want to talk about what underpins this, uh, what's happening right now in, in technology overall. So this is Moore's Law, uh, and it's effectively the notion that every 18 months, for the last 40 years, processing power has doubled. Now we tend to think of things in sort of linear terms. So if I take 30 linear steps, uh, by the time I've taken 30 steps, I'm in the back of the room somewhere. If I take 30 exponential steps, which is what Moore's Law has done every year for the, every 18 months for the last 40 years, I'm past the moon, and that's just my most recent step. And this is what's happening with our processors. <laughs> All right. We close that? Yeah, that's right. It's the incumbents. So uh, this is the reason that, that your cell phones are now more powerful than the computers they had on the lunar lander, this, this law that underpins this. If we look at how this actually uh, comes into play, the cost per gigabyte in 1980 was about a million dollars. 2015, it's now five cents. It's a 20 million times increase in, the, in terms of the cost efficiency for memory. It's the reason that your laptops are a terabyte in size and your phones are 128 gigs. From a calculations per, per second standpoint, we're looking at 1,000 calculations per second in 1980, and right now we're up to a trillion, which is a billion times increase. That's how many calculations computers are doing per second. This has happened, again, every year, every 18 months for the last 40 years, this growth. And so we've seen that sort of start to manifest. In 1997, uh, the first computer became a chess champion. Chess is a reasonably complicated game, as I'm sure a lot of you guys know. You can make about 37 moves in a, on an average chess game, uh, or 37 options per move in chess. The best chess player in the world going forward will always be a computer. Okay, in 2004, uh, Watson, which was developed by IBM, became a Jeopardy champion. Now we're not talking about 37 moves, we're talking about billions of options. And to think that uh, that was in 2004, and again, this is, this is doubled in processing efficiency every year, or every 18 months, excuse me, uh, puts us in a really interesting position. A and so this is the most recent one, it's, it's called Go. Now a lot of us don't play Go, it's, it's mostly of Eastern origin, but Go is an incredibly complicated game. There's about 250 moves, or options per move, which means by move two, you have 62,000 options that you can make within this game. And this computer is now a Go champion. But the really compelling thing about this is that that same algorithm uh, is now, within a matter of months, superhuman at virtually every Atari game. So this is the same piece of code, right? So we're talking about solving incredibly complex things uh, over a diverse nature of problems. And so I think about the implications of that for our financial lives when we're talking about uh, things that can process information a million times the speed of a human. I can now, you know, I'm, we're a matter of years away before I can ask a computer, should I take this trip? And it's going to process that information a million times faster than the smartest people in the world. Which means if I give that computer an answer and I say, get this back to me in a week, it's like locking the smartest people in the world in a room for 20,000 years. They're going to come back with a really compelling answer. And so, while this is all sort of very abstract and conceptual and feels like a moonshot, uh, the only thing that needs to happen for this to become a reality and significantly impact uh, not just the financial technology industry, but the banking industry and our finances overall, is exactly the same thing that's happened for the last 40 years. Right? This is the path that we're on according to Moore's Law. And so I'm really excited about this. I think that there's enormous opportunities for Canadian consumers here, enormous opportunities for Canadian banks uh, and Canadian fintechs. And so, uh, you know, I think it's going to be a, a really interesting fi five years in fintech in Canada. So I thank you guys very much for your time.
That was fantastic. Um, I love the uh, I love the Go uh, analogy because that's fairly recent that a computer managed to do that. And for years, they um, the experts in AI were trying to figure this out. Um, I think it's a South Korean game. But when they went and talked to the grandmasters of Go, there was something that they couldn't quite describe. Maybe it's gamma, but it was a gut instinct that allowed them to win. And it was something that, they, that a computer just couldn't replicate until now. So what we're talking about here is algorithms that also start to mimic really human qualities. Uh, and that is sort of where it gets pretty exciting, because so much of what we're talking about here is uh, interfacing with humans.